All right, good morning, everyone, Grand Rising. Let folks uh, get in and get settled. Thank you for joining us again this morning. Hopefully you all are enjoying the conference so far. We're so happy to have you with us today. So just give folks a few more seconds to get in and get settled. And this morning you are in the Seed Saving Sunday. We have a wonderful panel. So please sit back, get a cup of coffee and relax. And again, so glad to have you with us. And as a reminder, the, your conference uh, registration, it includes and allows you access to the SEED conference, as well as the amazing 60 plus workshops that NOFA New York has put on. And it's a, a very broad range of topics and presenters to learn from both. So both the SEED conference and winter conference are all in one program, and we'll put that into the chat for you. Uh, and those recordings are up. If you want to go back and start looking at them, I've had a chance to do that, and they, they are wonderful. We are also pasting into the chat the community agreements, which frames the respectful and supportive atmosphere all attendees have a responsibility to create as we're creating community here. Please take a moment to review these agreements if you have not already. We will place the agreements in the chat, and you've heard us refer to them all through the conference, so feel free to um, pull that website from the chat and look at those. We wanna take some time to thank our wonderful sponsors that have supported this conference. You see them on the screen now. Uh, their fiscal support represents their belief in, combined, in the combined value of community, education, and sustainable agriculture. You can reach out to them through the social network. So take a look at their website, see what they have. And again, we are grateful for their continued support. All Black, Indigenous, and People of Color conference attendees are invited to access the In Living Color Affinity Space facilitated by Amanda David and Mandana Bushi. And to access that space, contact them via email, which we will also place in the chat. All right. Welcome, welcome everyone to the Northeast Community Seed Conference and celebration. And it has been a wonderful celebration. Uh, the 2023 Northeast Community Seed Conference is planned entirely by volunteers in partnership with NOFA New York. And big shout out to NOFA New York, um, big love for them in terms of helping us host uh, and put on. We do this in conjunction with them and we're very grateful uh, to be able to do that. Northeast is defined as an area from Maryland through ascending US states crowned with Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and Atlantic Canada. If you are joining us from beyond the Northeast, don't worry about it, all are welcome. The Seed Conference intends to cultivate a respectful regional seed community that learns and grows together and supports each other through joy and hardship. Another way to be a part of this regional seed community is to join the Organic Seed Commons at www.organicseedcommons.org. You uh, will put that link in the chat for you. Within the Organic Seed Commons, you will find various regional seed network groups. And please join the Northeast Regional Seed Network. So it'd be great to join that. And then the community can just continue to build. You've seen this land acknowledgement a couple of times throughout the conference. Uh, we invite all present to use the Zoom chat to introduce themselves and to name the First Nation lands they occupy to discover upon whose lands you live, visit Native Land Digital at, uh, w, at uh, colon backslash native-land.ca. You see the website here on the screen. We will place it in the chat. Um, I am actually broadcasting from the Pecumtuck area. 
um, land of the Pecumtuck people, which is in modern day Springfield, Massachusetts. And so you can put where you're located and, and the people, the indigenous people that are on that land that you're stewarding, just put that in the chat. Rather than relegating plants to their lenient classification of family, we ask all present to consider families of people that have been abundantly supported by plants through time. Everyone here and their loved ones simply do not exist without the gifts given by plants. First among those gifts are seeds. Without these seeds, we do not live. Something to think about. And as a pause before we start planting this season, Every plant has origin in a specific place, near or far from here, and many have undergone journeys across the earth and back. Before planting, take a moment to ask yourself, one, what do I know of the lands and hands that have shaped and supported this plant? If I have purchased these seeds, do I know where the seeds I rely upon have come from and who has grown them? What can I do going forward to respect this plant, those places, and those individuals, regardless of how near or how far away. And many of us think of seed as something we buy from a catalog rather than from cherished plants we harvest seed from ourselves. The buying of seeds from catalogs or now online is a relatively new reality. So take a moment to imagine what it would look and feel like to share seed in the community rather than only through commerce. So today, um, your hosts are Janine Shifford and myself, uh, Sister Anna Muhammad. I'm with NOFA Mass. We just finished our winter conference. I'm based in Springfield, Mass, as I mentioned before. And Janine, would you like to introduce yourself real quickly? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Janine Shefford, and I am calling in actually uh, from Seed Savers Exchange um, and also co-chair of Community Seed Network, which you'll hear about later. Happy to be here. All right. So we are our, your co-host today, um, and I'm so glad to be here with Janine and, and here with our awesome presenters. And so our presenters this morning will be Jillian Bishop, Kate Green, uh, Stephen McCumber or Silver Bear, Marsha Vernick, Sonia Brin, and Zach Goldberg. And so what we'll do, um, this is in our seed saving morning, is I'm going to allow our esteemed presenters to introduce introduce themselves uh, very quickly, and then we'll start with uh, Jillian Bishop and Kay Green, and they can go further into their introductions after we do this brief introduction. So Jillian, if you can introduce yourself brief briefly, then we'll move to Kay Green, Silva Bear, Masha Vernick, Sonia Bren, and then Zach Goldberg. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jill Bishop. I'm uh, coming in today from Nogoji Wanong, the place at the end of the rapids. Um, sometimes referred to as Peterborough, Ontario. So nice to see everybody this morning. All right, thank you. And then Kay Green, introduce yourself. Good morning all, I'm Kay Green. Uh, I am with the Hudson Valley Seed Company and also work with the organization called Hudson Valley Farm Hub doing seed rematriation work. I am in the Hudson Valley uh, working with both uh, the original peoples of this land, uh, Mohawk community in Akwesasne and folks from the Lenape Center. Thank you for that. And then we will go to Silver Bear. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Silver Bear. Good morning. My name is Silver Bear. I'm a Mohawk from Ganawage, which is uh, situated just close to the city of Montreal. Uh, I'm a member of the Haudenosaunee Iroquois Confederacy. We are made up of uh, six nations, Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, Senecas, and Tuscarora. And uh, I've been involved um, since I've been a boy, learning from my, my grandfather how to plant in the garden. And I developed some networks amongst our, our, our communities. And I recently was voted uh, and elected a chief, Mohawk chief here in Ganawage. And on my platform was food security and food sovereignty. So all this just happened in December. So I'm really proud of that. And I'm really looking forward to uh, reaching out to a lot of people and uh, and sharing. And that's always been part of our ways. It's always about sharing. So mm -hmm. it's a wonderful opportunity. And I uh, say hello to everybody here this morning. All right. Thank you. Zach, yeah, 
you round us out and then we'll give it over to Jillian. Cool, I'm, I'm Zach Goldberg. I'm a uh, PhD student at Penn State Geography and I do research with the Jewish Farmer Network and the Jewish Seed Project. And I'm really happy to be here this morning. Thanks everyone. And I'm gonna be I am gonna be joined later. Ken and I will be joined later by um two of our friends on the west coast, Masha and Sonia, um, where it's very early there. So thank you so much. We'll turn everything over to Jillian and Ken. Go right ahead. All right, good morning. So we thought we should start with uh some of the seed words um, because um, we know there are some beginners um, here and I think it's important to understand uh, the language that we use to talk about seeds and in particular seed saving. So I'm gonna start off and then I'm gonna hand it over to Jill and then we'll have some time for Q and A. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. All right. So just wanted to give a little bit of context to this idea of seed words and seed language in that it can often be presented as like, this is fact, this is truth. These are the words that we all use. Um, and I think it's more layered and nuanced and complex um, than that. And I think anyone who has a garden or is farming understands that everything we grow, every seed is situated within a network, that there are threads connecting many different um, parts of our lives um, and our, our values and our culture and our idea of self um, and views of the world. Uh, and so I just wanted to go through and talk a little bit about that before we get into some of the terms. And I think the first term we need to start with, the first word is the word seed. Uh, and what is a seed? And it sounds like a silly question maybe, but depending on how we think about what is a seed, it actually changes our relationship to seeds and the way that we work with seeds. For me, one of the first things that I think about when I think about seeds is uh, transformation. And I, I share this slide a lot in lectures that I do that aren't in the Northeast where people talk about winter and I'm like, you don't know winter. <laughs> Like, let's talk about like what winter really, really looks like. But, you know, for us here, you know, there are all these seeds sleeping. We, we know that there are seeds in our jars at home and, and, or in our coolers or in envelopes waiting um, for the winter. And, you know, seeds are really about transformation. And I think when you live with seasons, you really understand that, you know, a seed is transformation. Um, and just going from winter, and I cannot wait for this <laughs> to happen, uh, you know, the same field, and it's been transformed because of seeds. So when we start thinking about these seed words and seed terms, a lot of times when I say, what is a seed, people think of this biological definition, you know, it's a fertilized ovule, or it's a plant embryo, um, the sort of science, uh, which is Western science, um, way of defining a seed as uh, almost like a vehicle, um, as, a, as a, a lot of parts that add up into a, uh, something that is part of reproduction. There's other ways that people think about what is a seed. So, you know, going back to when there was still Monsanto before they were absorbed into Bayer, Robert Fraley, who was the CTO there, said a seed is a technology to make farmers more productive and profitable. So we can see the way that biotech and pharmaceutical treat seeds and work with seeds based on thinking about them as technology. Carrie Fowler, you know, one of the founders of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, uh, you know, says seeds are a means for adaptation, um, which is the requirement for survival. He's thinking about genetic resources, seeds as genetic resources. Um, and there's a you know, certain way of thinking about the world as you know, what are resources and what resources do we need from the planet for our survival as humans. Ira, if you didn't see the wonderful article in New York Times about Ira that just came out, um, uh, seeds are the stories and places that they came from. Very different way of thinking about what is a seed. 
Vandana Shiva, seed is created to renew, to multiply, to be shared, and to spread. Seed is life itself. Again, a very different way of approaching what is a seed and, and the language of seeds. Ai Weiwei, amazing um, artist who did this incredible installation of ceramic sunflower seeds. The seed is a household object, but at the same time, it's a revolutionary symbol. Or Michael Pollan, seeds have the power to preserve species, to enhance cultural as well as genetic diversity, to counter economic monopoly, and to check the advance of conformity on all its many fronts. These are all different ways of thinking about that one word, seed, and what is a seed. So before we get into some of these terms, I think it's also important to look inward a little bit and into our own bodies and into our own cultures and perceptions of the world and think about how do we listen to and learn from seeds without the words. When I started, I didn't have a lot of these words. I didn't have a background in biology or in plants or in agriculture. Um, I learned to save seeds from plants by watching plants do what they do. The words became important tools later and understanding the words became important as, as part of my growth as a seed keeper and as a seed saver and eventually as a seed producer for the seed company. Um, but I think it's important to start with ourselves and think about the senses that we use to learn about plants, sight, smell, taste, hearing, touch. And depending on who you are, you use these or don't use these different senses in different ways. But beyond that, we have uh, vestibular senses. Um, we have senses around movement. Our ancestors are part of the ways that we perceive the world. Our traditions, our cultures are part of how we sense plants and our personal and lived experiences play very much into our understanding of plants and how we are part of the life cycle of a plant. Um, and not just some of the words that we're about to learn. But four of the big ones that I wanted to cover because they get used a lot in seed catalogs and in conversations are these four kind of genres or divisions that people think of, uh, of uh, in terms of what is a seed. We talk about open pollinated seeds. We talk about genetically engineered seeds, we talk about heirloom and hybrid. So I put one image of each of those categories up here. Um, so the four that I chose for this time are purple peacock broccoli, sun gold cherry tomato, temptation sweet corn, and Hank's extra special bacon bean. So just take a moment. I think we have a lot of smart people in the room. So you probably know these varieties more than some of the other beginners that I work with, but take a look and then in the chat, um just put your guesses um what do you think purple peacock broccoli is do you think it's a hybrid an heirloom genetically engineered or open pollinated so for each one just you know put in your guesses in there don't be shy um and then in less than 30 seconds <laughs> i will um, do the big reveal and we'll talk about what those terms mean and which is which All right, so I hope you thought a little bit about what you think temptation is, what you think sun gold is, what you think purple peacock is, and what you think Hanks is. And so the next slide, if it will go to the next slide, why is it stuck? There we go. So Hanks is an heirloom, temptation sweet corn is genetically engineered, Sun gold is a hybrid and purple peacock is uh, open pollinated. So I wanna start with the term heirloom really um, because I think it's a word that gets used a lot when we talk about um, seeds and values around seeds. Heirloom is really a term that started being used in the late seventies and really became very more like more popular 
in the 90s to talk about a seed that um, has value to people beyond its yield, beyond its nutrition, beyond um, what it sort of has to offer as a, as a plant um, for usury. The way that we think about heirloom objects that are passed down generation to generation that have more value within that family because of the history, because of sentimental value, because of uh, memory, um, that that object may not be worth a lot uh, to someone else, um, but it has a lot of value and a lot of meaning within that family. So seeds passed down generation to generation. Um, it's still somewhat of a, a sort of Western um, uh, colonial type term to think about heirlooms in this way. Um, but it was a really useful term to, to say seeds have more value than what is perceived in the commercial world. The other great thing about heirlooms are there was there's a lot more diversity than what's being offered um, in other types like hybrids um, and especially genetic engineered, but also there's some diversity inherent in heirlooms um, in terms of they're not uniform the way that hybrids are and there's a lot of benefit to that. And if you know how to save seeds, you can save seeds from heirlooms and they will grow true to type. It's really important. Let's skip over to purple peacock. It's open pollinated. All heirloom varieties are open pollinated. So there's a little bit of a trick there, a trick question there. Um, so all heirloom varieties are open pollinated, but not all open pollinated varieties are heirloom. That's just a factor of time. Heirlooms have been with us a long time. Some people say 50, 60 years as a sort of cutoff. Some people say 100. So there's new open pollinated varieties coming out. They increase genetic diversity, which is a really important part of um, being a seed saver in the modern context. Um, and if you know what you're doing for saving seeds, they will grow true to type. Also, open pollinated varieties don't have restrictions on them for who can save seeds. Um, and share seeds from seeds that have been saved from plants. Um, so uh, for example, in our catalog for Hudson Valley Seed Company, we only offer uh, heirloom and open pollinator varieties because we believe um, you know, part of our values is that people should have independence in the garden, people should be able to save and share their own seeds, and people should be able to adapt seeds to their particular climate or their tastes um, or their cultural values. If we go to Sun Gold Cherry Tomato Hybrid, I choose that one because it's beloved. People love their Sun Golds. Um, even people who are diehard, only heirloom and open pollinated seed people still grow Sun Gold because they love the flavor so much. And for some folks, they think about uh, heirloom, they think about tomatoes, they think about flavor. And so they assume that Sun Gold is an heirloom because they love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just because you love something doesn't mean that it's an heirloom. Uh, so a hybrid is uh, when two pure lines have been um, bred for specific characteristics, they're crossed, and that first generation or that F1 uh, expresses specific traits that the breeders were looking for. And um, usually those you know, pure lines are kept kind of secret by whoever the breeder or the company. Uh, corporation is because they don't want other people reproducing the same uh, F1 um, hybrid. There are some benefits to hybrids. It's not like a good and evil kind of proposition. Um, but some of what I see as the concerns about hybrids are when you save seeds from hybrids, they revert back to char random characteristics of the parent plant. So they don't grow true to type. So you love a hybrid you get dependent on it um, if that seed company is dropping the variety or you see an opportunity to adapt it to your region. Um, you don't really have that independence. Um, and hybrids can come with other types of patents um, and restrictions that actually make it uh, not legal to save and share seeds. What I wanna debunk here is people say, you can't save seeds from hybrids, you can. You absolutely can save seeds from hybrids. Don't, don't let anyone tell you there's something that you can't save seeds from. I, you know, I could, I'm not going to get sued, hopefully, for saying this. Um, you know, the, the PVPs and the 
the plant variety protections and some of the patents that are that are put on seeds and traits do restrict the ability to um, resell those seeds. But in your home garden, on your farm, you just have to know that it's going to start desegregating into random characteristics of the parent plant. That can be amazing. We've worked with hybrids and untangled them and created incredible new OP varieties out of hybrids. So don't let that word scare you off. Genetic engineering, temptation sweet corn. I'm not going to get into GE too much. That could be like a two-hour conversation on its own. But I think in very broad strokes, we're talking about um, technological processes that insert genetic traits or, or uh, genetic expressions into plants that you could never breed into a plant using uh, the ways that plants reproduce and share genetics. With heirlooms and open pollinated and hybrid, we're talking about natural processes. We're talking about working with plants the way that they share pollen, the way that they, they share stories with each other, the way that um, they cross pollinate. Genetic engineering is, is something completely different um, from that, and it is illegal to save seeds um, from genetically engineered uh, varieties. So that's the broad strokes of those four uh, terms really quickly. So we want to get into the seed words. Um, and just again, to remember that language is cultural. So these words are words that maybe you've heard, um, maybe that we assume are the truth or, or fact because we associate them with science. Science is a culture. Science is embedded in culture. Um, the Western sciences have grown out of specific cultures and specific time periods with their own attitudes about the world and how we treat the world and how we work with plants. See, these words are great tools um, and can really help you uh, be um, skilled seed savers, but I think it's okay to question them. And just one of the lenses that I wanna introduce as we think about these words uh, is this idea of binary botany or non-binary botany. Um, that many of the words that we are about to share come from very binary perspectives, come from Western perspectives that hierarchicalize male over female, um, that think about uh, categorization through binomial nomenclature of um, class uh, kingdoms, for example, like who, who's in power and who's in charge. There's a sexualization of plants um, inherent in the current way that science is very binary. Um, and so, you know, if we have time, we'll talk about this some more, but part of my work is around non-binary botany and really thinking through uh, some of these terms, the history, especially Linnaean history that they're rooted in, some of the issues with that and thinking through, are there other words and other ways of talking about plants that don't invoke uh, a colonized uh, botany um, and can really help us with our relationships with plants. And so I'm going to hand it off to Jill to talk about uh, some of these different words. Thank you so much. That was a great introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, so I am with Kay that I uh, learned a lot about plants and um, seed saving by watching plants themselves. So I am not a biologist. I will <laughs> open up with that. Plants are, are sort of the biggest teacher, um, but we do have a lot of sort of biological terms that we see come up in seed saving a lot. So we are going to review some of them and I really appreciate Kay giving this sort of you know, context, a lot of these have come through Western science and as seed savers, we kind of interpret them in our in our fields. Uh, so I think that that was a really great introduction to get us started. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm coming in from uh, Nogo Zhizhuang, the place at the end of the rapids, uh, sometimes known as Peterborough, Ontario. In Peterborough, I'm an urban seed farmer. So a big part of what I do is teach people how to save seeds as the work that I do. Uh, to which people have told me, why would you do that? <laughs> because you're going to put yourself out of business. I run a very small seed business called Urban Tomato. Uh, but so far that hasn't happened. And I do really enjoy teaching people uh, how to save their own seeds and watch them get delighted by the process. So just some pictures of, of my garden on warmer sunny days to enjoy. <laughs> 
so we're going to go through a lot of different terms while I'm talking to you today, but nobody wants me to read every single one of these terms off the slides, nor do I really want to read every one of these terms off the slides. So I'm going to introduce some of them, but I'm also going to talk to you about why knowing this information can be useful as a seed saver. So sometimes we see, you know, we're reading a seed pack and we might see a lot of different names on the, the seed pack. There might be a common name, a cultivar, or even a botanical name that's a little bit more of its Latin name, or even an overall cultivar group such as broccoli that might encompass a whole lot of different cultivars in itself, such as that beautiful purple sprouting broccoli that Kay mentioned. So having an idea about how some of these names work is important when it comes to seed saving, because if you're a seed saver, certain plants can cross. And so having an understanding of how plants cross will help you save seeds and have a deeper understanding of, of how to prevent that from happening. Another plant piece that you might see on seed packs is this idea of is the plant an annual, a biannual, or perennial. These terms can be quite useful because it helps you understand the life cycle of a plant. So if you're going to be saving seeds from an annual, which encompasses most plants that complete their full life cycle in one season. So a huge amount of our vegetable crops, such as beans, cucumbers, squash, are annuals. And if you're a seed saver, that means you can save those seeds within the first season that you are growing those crops. If you are going to try to save seeds from bi biennials, these are a plant that germinates over winters, at least here in Ontario, and then produces the seed in the second season. So if you're going to try to save seeds from something like a carrot, you need to have an understanding that it will not produce seed until the second season. So this would be important for understanding how that plant works. When we talk about perennial, this would be many of our fruits and sometimes uh, asparagus or certain vegetables that sort of continue to live on for multiple years and may produce seed every year in their life cycle after they have established themselves. So you don't need to memorize all these terms, but having an understanding of what they are will help you sort of understand the life cycle of your plant and when it will produce seeds for you to be able to collect it. People are welcome to type any questions in the chat box as we go. We do have a moderator and we're going to have some questions at the end, but if there's a point of clarification or anything people need, you're welcome to, to chime in. So I mentioned, you know, I'm not a botanist, I'm not a biologist, but again, having some understanding of how plants organize themselves can also help you learn how to save seeds from them. So you may have a family, which is sort of a group of plants that have similar basic features and common ancestors. We have a genus that is a group of plants that also have quite similar characteristics, but are different. A species can interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring. So this is really important if you're saving seed because you wanna be able to collect seeds from these species. Then we have a variety, which would be something like the specific name of a plant, like a market more cucumber, for example. So when we're learning about plants, we have all these different subcategories that can help us understand how plants are related and how plants might intercross with one another. So many people might not necessarily know if you're not a biologist or a seed saver in the world of brassicas, for example, we could have plants that look incredibly different, such as kale and broccoli, but they are related and they can intercross. So it is important to have this understanding of the divisions, although they are very based in Western science, at least this lens can help you understand which seed varieties might intercross with each other and which may be able to stay true to type and not have to worry about this. As an urban seed farmer, I work with very limited space. So gaining a deep understanding of which plants can grow close together without crossing and which plants need their own space is, is very, very critical to success. So again, just understanding a little bit about how family, genus and species of plant categories really is just designed to help you understand which crops can cross with one another and how plants stay true to type. I'm not gonna quiz you on this and expect you to memorize all these elements, but if you see this name, it could be helpful to understanding which are going to cross. So pollination. We all love pollinators. We love our bees, we love our butterflies. We love all those wonderful insects in our gardens that help spread pollen around. 
But as a seed saver, we do have to be very careful of that and have an understanding of how pollination works. So its basic root is that it's the process of fertilizing plants. So how plants can produce seed. We have, you know, if we want to talk about the specific plant pieces, we have the union of the poll pollen with the ovule, which will eventually produce seed. And pollen is just a grain that is produced by the plant that will help fertilize our ovules. So again, this is a lot of biology. You don't need to know all the deep depths of plant biology, but understanding how your plants produce seed will help you become a more successful seed saver. So we do have all these elements of a flower. If you're like me, you really love flowers. Um, and when you look at them up close, you can see how they produce pollen and how they will fertilize one another. Now we do, Kay mentioned, you know, a lot of the scientific elements do really try to gender the plants. And you will see that come quite common up in a lot of the scientific sort of Western knowledge but really you're just understanding how a plant produces offspring and how it carries on its seed or how in nature it would continue to, to bear fruit, flower, seed, whatever it is that can help the plant continue to reproduce so that we can get lots of seeds and continue to enjoy all these incredible crops throughout time. So you will often see these sort of images that will describe to you exactly all the different parts of a flower and how that breaks down in order for the plant to be able to produce pollen and seeds so that we can enjoy all these different elements. Um, Kay, I don't know if you have anything further you want to say about the idea of sort of non-binary botany in relation to this, or if there's anything that you wanted to add to this section. Um, I think... I think we're good. Maybe if folks are curious about it, we can, um, you know, they can put questions about that in the chat. I just think, you know, the, you know, part of where this starts is this idea of male and female parts, um, which is a very sort of Western science way of looking at things is like, how, like, how do we break things down into their small parts and how do we label those parts rather than thinking about the whole. So when we look at something like a perfect flower, that pollinates itself, and that doesn't need to exchange pollen with anything else. Um, you know, thinking about male and female parts, you know, it, it's called a perfect flower, and I love that term um, <laughs> because we don't have to break it down into those parts. We don't have to think about male and female. We can think about the flower as a whole, and even when we look at outcrossing plants, which I, I think you'll probably get into um, in a moment. Um, the same plant has uh, flowers that are producing pollen and uh, flowers that are producing fruit. Um, so one thing that I see people do is they start to gender the plant when that really doesn't make sense because the plant has everything it needs um, and it isn't um, gendered in the same way that we think of animals. And also since we're broadening our concepts of gender for humans, um, and really starting to recognize that, you know, this binary system of thinking about people as one gender or another, or one sex as another, doesn't really work. Um, it's time to question that for how we assign those terms to everything else in the world around us. Um, and maybe there's ways of talking about and thinking about plants that actually deepen our understanding of plants in the plant world, rather than overlaying this cultural uh, sort of dominant cultural way of, of breaking things down into sex and gender. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I think it's a really great lens for us to consider as we start, you know, understanding a little bit more about some of the, the biology of these plants is to think about it as, you know, plants have lots to teach us in ourselves and we don't always need to put them in the sort of box um, that, that sort of Western science has, has tried to convey biology and botany for a very long time, at least in, in the, the communities in which I, I live here in Canada. So again, you know, learning about these different parts of the plants is really about understanding how a plant can produce pollen, how it can become fertilized. And also it is a result of that understanding how you are gonna get seed and how you can prevent some of this sort of crossing or learn how to keep your seeds true to type. 
So, you know, as Kay mentioned, there are several types of pollination. So we have self self pollinating plants, which are sort of these, you know, perfect flowers that can um, transfer their pollen from an anther to a stigma inside of the same plant. They don't need other flowers. So, you know, one example might be, say, you're growing something in a greenhouse. They don't necessarily need to have a lot of pollinators. They don't necessarily need to have um, pollen coming from another flower. So if you're a brand new seed saver, these are great places to start. These are tomatoes, our lettuces, some of our peppers, lots of seeds that are very easy, beans, great place to start if you're a brand new seed saver. If we talk about cross-pollinating, these are plants that we do need the pollen to travel from one flower to another in order for the plant to be fertilized, to produce a fruit and eventually seed. So these are our squashes is a number, you know, very common term. And I know uh, Silver Bear is gonna talk about squashes in, in a little bit. Uh, we do also have wind pollinated plants. So this would be something like corn that the pollen needs to actually travel between several species such as corn, beets and spinach. So again, having an understanding of how a plant produces and shares pollen is important to understanding of how to produce high quality true to type seed. Jill, can I just add about, oh, you're going to go more into sulfur and go ahead. When yeah. you're talking sulfur and crosser, um, I might want to weigh in. Sure, please do. So yes, the sulfur, you know, is the sort of self-pollinating. Uh, that's a tomato flower right there. So I mean, this wasn't my slide. The term mate with themselves is a bit strange and we could definitely talk about that. Um, but self-pollinating versus crossers. So crossers, you know, the pollen is coming from somewhere else. And so if anybody has ended up with a zumpkin or pumpkini in their compost pile, or even when they're trying to save seeds, this is the result of a, a plant cross-pollinating in a way that you might not have meant to. You might have found the coolest, newest, exciting heirloom. Um, but this is how you end up with something like a, a pumpkin or a zumpkin and an interesting sort of new crop that you didn't necessarily uh, intend to grow in the first place. <laughs> was there something else you wanted to add to that, Okay. Yeah, just when I learned about these terms, it was really presented as a binary of like, it's either self-pollinating or it's outcrossing. Um, and just over time, working with the plants, you start to see that it's a continuum and you can sort of slide plants around on that continuum of how close they are to self-pollinating and how close they are to, to crossing that it's not an either or. And I think that's important when you start you know, looking at isolation and other ways of keeping things true to type that you have to sort of pay attention to the continuum more than it's either this or this. Yeah, I learned that lesson when I went to a workshop with the Cottage Gardener, if anyone from this area is familiar to um, with them, and they were talking about peppers. And in my mind, I'd always thought of them as being self-pollinating. You don't need a lot of distance, very easy to save seeds from. But I would say they are one that sort of exist on that continuum that you, you know, you do still have to be very careful to learn from those plants and understand how they do end up crossing and integrating with each other because they aren't just so simple self-pollinating and they aren't quite crossers either. So they are sort of in, in that spectrum. And again, I think it really is about listening to the plants. I mean, one of the greatest thing about being a seed saver is being able to watch a plant go through its entire life cycle. And there is so much to learn from that. And anybody who has done it understands you might be able to put all these terms up, but plants don't always listen to those terms. And sometimes they have a lot to teach you along the way as you are watching and observing and, and paying attention. And as a seed saver, that's a critical component. And it, it is how you get to learn of all these uh, these nuances that the plant world has to share with us. So we want to know about how plants produce because we want to be able to save seed from them. There are a few terms that you'll see kind of come up in terms of seed saving that are sort of critical to helping you be a successful seed saver. One of them is this idea of population size. So how many plants of each variety should you plant in order to have a successful crop? Now, as an urban seed saver, I am often sort of limited on this, and I, I do understand there's variation in this, but to some degree, the more plants of each variety you can grow, the more diversity you're going to have and the greater diversity and success within the genetics of your seeds you'll have. 
As an urban seed saver, I say this is always fun to do with friends and community as well. And think about diversifying the number of people that you're growing seeds with as part of this. So think about who you're growing seeds with and, and the community in which is saving seeds around you in terms of diversifying your population as well. Isolation is another huge concept. You'll see a lot come up in seed saving. So if we are worried about plants crossing with one another, particularly those, those crossers, we need to separate one plant or a group of plant from another to prevent cross-pollination. So we need to have an isolation distance. You can do this just by leaving a, a prescribed amount of space between these two like crops. So for example, if you're growing 10 varieties of heirloom tomatoes, you need to separate each variety by that distance that is prescribed. There are a few other ways you can do this. Time isolation, for example, if you're planting lettuces and you're sure they're gonna flower at different stages, that can help isolate those flowers. Uh, and we can also do mechanical isolation. So the idea of constricting a physical barrier, you know, something very simple pictured here, people have fancier pollination cages and also people will bag some of their flowers. So again, we love our pollination. We love our little pollinators, but sometimes they can kind of mess up your seed crop. So you need to find a way to be able to, to isolate like varieties. This is true for selfers and crossers. Even certain things like tomatoes, you shouldn't grow a ton of different varieties of tomatoes right next to each other. They're not guaranteed to intercross, but they definitely can. And when you move into the crossers, the isolation distances are gonna get a lot farther. I will speak to some references towards the end, but if anybody is familiar with Seeds of Diversity, they have this really great book. And in the back, they have a chart and it tells you the population size and the isolation distance recommended for all the main crops. So very useful if you wanna find out for specific varieties and crops. Another method you could use to prevent the sort of uh, crossing or help things stay true to type, especially when you're using crossers as hand pollination. So this is the action of you sort of intervening and pollinating your squash crops and closing up the flower at the end to prevent this cross pollination. It can take some time, but it does again, help you get to know your plant really well and understand a little bit more about the botany beyond just terms in a book and get to see a little bit how pollen does move from flower to flower and how plants can be fertilized in order to produce seeds. So you can see me sort of doing some, some hand pollination here with some of my um, crops and especially as an urban seed farmer in small spaces, this is a pretty critical skill to, to develop. Okay, so you may also come across some of these sort of terms and seed collection or, or sort of general seed saving terms. So the idea of roguing is simply to remove an atypical plant from your collection. You may or may not want to do this. Maybe something really cool is showing up, but maybe you have a really, really rare variety or something that's really unique that you don't want a diversification or something that just seems very out of what you're trying to save seeds from exists. You may need to pull it out. This is totally up to the individual seed saver. Some people really like to have all these differences and mix those up. Others would really want to make sure that their, you know, black Russian tomato stays exactly as it looked on the package. And so if you have one that shows some deviation from that, it, it could be removed. Could also be human error. I've done this every once in a while. I'll see a lettuce that's a different variety in my row. I'm not quite sure how it got there, but if I don't want uh, that, being mixed up with my seeds as I collect it, I, I may need to remove it. Um, the idea of bolt. So you'll see this particularly when it comes to lettuce or other flowers as just uh, lettuce producing seed. So it's bolting, it's going up to produce its flower. It is part of the life cycle. Uh, this one can be really important when you're talking to people who are brand new to seed saving, because if you ask them where you find lettuce seed, they might not have any idea. They might not understand that lettuce does as a life cycle of the plant bolt, and that is where you will find the flowers and the seed. So again, these are terms that you might just see, you know, advanced seed savers just kind of drop, expecting that you know, and maybe many of you do know them, but this is something you'll sort of see come up again and again. The idea of root type, I've sort of mentioned that a few times, just conform conforming to the known characteristics of your variety. 
every seed saver would have a different way of what this definition is. And they might like a lot of diversity and they might like it smaller and that's okay. There's no specific strict rules on this. So just quickly talking about seed collection terminology. So we have dry seeds and wet seeds. Dry seeds are, you know, the most common one would be a bean pod. So we know that we let the plant go through its entire life cycle, produce the seed and let it dry down right on the plant. This is me with a huge kale uh, plant that I'm collecting seed from here. Uh, and when you're cleaning dry seed, you're gonna be freshing it, which is the idea of separating seed from chaff. Uh, you might flail it, which is the idea of jumping up and down maybe on bean pods. If you ever work with kids or even adults that like to have fun, it's a great way of, of getting all your bean seed collected. Um, we have the idea of winnowing, which is using wind or air to help separate seed from chaff. Uh, a lot of the time you'll see people use fans for this. Um, I have a seed aspirator, which is a big game changer and you hook it up to a vacuum and it helps you with that. Um, but you will always see that good quality seed is heavier than the chaff. So basically you're using air to allow the heavy seed to fall and the chaff to blow away. Um, and when we're talking about wet seed, those would be things like our tomatoes, peppers, and cucurbits. And so there is a different method of collecting these seeds in order to be ensuring that you have high quality seed that you're collecting. Um, I know a lot of our panelists, including myself this afternoon, are going to go into a little bit more of the details of how to collect wet and dry seed. So I won't spend too much time on the details, but just knowing the sort of differentiations Can between those. Cucurbit seeds ferment in its goop. Yes, fermentation absolutely is a big part of that, definitely. So I, I will show you how to do that, at least for tomatoes this afternoon. Um, and I'm sure the other presenters will, will reference it as well. Um, and I, I just kind of wanted to wrap up with, with these ideas of seed sovereignty and rematriation. You know, I think people have um, are gaining a deeper understanding of the importance, as Kay really referenced, of understanding seeds through lenses of the cultures that preserved and continue to maintain and steward these seeds so that we can have them. Um, and I, I think it's really important for us to acknowledge those histories, those stories, and, and the people that were responsible for ensuring we have this massive diversity of seed uh, and the right for farmers to continue to breed and save seeds. Um, so I just wanted to reference this idea of, of seed sovereignty, which is our continual right to save these seeds. Uh, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Rowan White, who speaks to this idea of rematriation and making sure that seeds are brought home to those cultures that, that have maintained and stewarded these seeds um, since time immemorial and continue to ensure that those seeds are, are respected and growing and maintained. Um, so getting these seeds out of libraries or archaeological places or where these living beings are being stored, we want to make sure we get them back into the hands of, of farmers and growers. So these are sort of terms you may see come up. I know I didn't cover all of them, but I hope as you go through this afternoon, you'll sort of hear some of these and have a little bit more understanding of, of what they mean and which ones are most relevant to, to your seed saving. Um, I think we do have some time for, for questions. If, if mm -hmm. people have some, I wasn't monitoring the chat box at the time. I'm yeah. <laughs> happy to answer some if they are out there. <laughs> No worries. Um, just as a reminder, folks, if you do have questions, you can place them in the chat and Janine and I are, are looking out for those questions. So we do have a few minutes. Um, we'll take our um, body break at 11 o'clock on the dot. So um, if there is any questions, feel free to put it in the chat right now. I know that was a lot of terms, but I yeah. <laughs> look at seeing a lot more hands-on activity as, as the day goes on for sure. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the commercial for this afternoon session. So <laughs> we'll get more into the nitty-gritty of working with those two types of seeds. So thank you for that, Jilly. So again, we have time for a few questions from uh, for our wonderful panel this morning. Um a quick question on hand pollination. I'll just start it off uh, while people are thinking. Um, is it easier to do that with some plants versus others? Um, say, is it much easier to do it with the cucurbit family versus, say, maybe tomatoes? 
or something smaller, or is it reserved to just one type of plant family? Do you have any insights on that, Kay, or do you want me to try to answer it? <laughs> it's a, it's a, I'm not sure some are harder, but there is different knowledge that's needed depending on what you're collecting pollen from and how that's done um, and how you're transferring the pollen. And part of that knowledge is understanding how, you know, that pollen is also alive and that there's a lifespan to it um, and that that's related to how humid it is outside and how hot it is um, and what time of day you're collecting. And so it's not that the physical act necessarily is easier or harder, um, but that the, the skill set for understanding um, the timing and collecting and transferring um, becomes specific, like species specific. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, right. lots of opportunity to learn from your plants. I think with some of the selfers, like tomatoes, you know, you're almost, I've heard people say they almost just shake the plant or kind of allow the plant to have a little bit more, you know, kindly give it a little hug, dance with it, um, you know, let it kind of share its pollen. Uh, whereas if you are the crossers, where you sort of have to physically remove a flower for a squash example and, and pollinate it yourself, there, there is definitely, um, as Kate was saying, an observation and, and an understanding of how the plants work um, that can be really critical to your success. But with everything I say, try it. <laughs> you know, it's the worst <laughs> gonna happen, it doesn't work, but at least you've sort of gained that understanding. Uh, and especially with the cross, the hand pollination for the squash, I, I learned so much about that squash plant by doing it. So it sort of has a valuable uh, chance for learning and, and for you to gain a deeper connection with your plants along the way, even if it's just to, to try it out and see how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, Janine, I think you've got some questions. So I'll turn this over to you. Yeah, it looks like we just got a question come in um, asking for a follow up that maybe there are some crops that are easier to save when you have a space that is shared with other growers. <laughs> uh, do you have any tips about sharing spaces <laughs> and saving? Well, that's one I, I do a lot, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I work with a lot of community gardeners, encouraging them to save seeds. And I also have a lot of neighbors who are also gardeners. So this one is an important to, uh, to know for sure. I think a lot of those selfers, so especially when you think about peas or beans, they're sort of like the least susceptible to crossing. So those are, are really great to start with. Um, and then you can kind of move towards some, some greens, tomatoes and peppers are also sort of in the, the easier category. Um, then as you move to squash, it can get more complicated because if your neighbor, even a couple doors down had a similar squash, it, it could end up cross pollinating with your plant. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, there are the easy ones, but this idea of population size or working with your community, it could be an opportunity for education and, you know, talk to some of your neighbors in the community garden or, or around you, wherever you're growing. And, and if you have a crop you really want to save seed from, maybe convince them they want to grow that, that crop as well. And it's an opportunity for, for conversation and, and chatting. So I always tell people to grow what they like. So if you really like squash, try it, you know, and, and be aware that there might be some crossing or some opportunity for conversation. But if you really want to be sure, you can start with some of those sort of easy selfers. And hey, I don't know if you have anything to, to add. Just that many of the community gardens that I've worked with who are interested in seeds, we actually established a seed plot. And so the community garden worked together to identify a variety of varieties that they wanted to grow seeds for that then they wanted to distribute out through the community. Um, and so then it was easier to get everyone in agreement of like, okay, like we all wanna grow this one variety. So we're not gonna grow other varieties of that same species this year, but we know we're all gonna get seeds together. <laughs> and then it's a learning experience for the, for the community garden as well. So that's another way to handle it. Um, it can be hard to say to folks, please don't grow. <laughs> <laughs> any zinnias this year because I want to save seeds from this one zinnia and then everyone's kind of like but I want it from my own zinnias um and so yeah that's all I would add <laughs> all right well thank you both for a wonderful presentation I know I've learned quite a bit and I know the rest of the audience has and we're looking forward to the next hour which is going to be also very informative 
Um, we will take a five minute break. We'll come back at 11.05. Uh, you don't have to exit the Zoom. Um, just take a body break, get a uh, snack, um, stretch, and then we will see you at 11.05. We'll, we will be joined by Silver Bear and the Jewish Farmer Network. Um, so looking forward to having you all back and please enjoy your break. See you at 11.05. Hi, um, I'm wondering if whoever's the host, it whoever the host is, would be able to put the uh, our group, the Jewish Farmer Network folks, into a breakout room just for a quick second to discuss something before our presentation. Let me see if I have that option. So that would be you, Zachary, Kay. Uh, who else would be on there? And Sonia. Sonia is Sonia on here? Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Oh, okay, great. Let me see if I can do that. Okay, I think this should work.
All right, we're coming back. Give folks a few more seconds to come back and we will start our second um, part. All right, everyone, so welcome back. We are moving into part two of our Seed Saving Sunday. We will be joined uh, in the second part by Silver Bear, uh, Masha Vernick, Sonia Bren, Zach Goldberg, and Kate Green. And so at this time, uh, I will turn things over to Silver Bear, and then we will uh, go on to our next group of presenters after him. So Silver Bear, it's all yours. Oh, you need to um, unmute Silver Bear. I realize uh, becoming an uh, heirloom. I'm not good with this technology. Uh, my name is Silver Bear or Steve McCumber. I'm a Mohawk uh, from Ganawage, which is just out of the other side of the city of Montreal. And I've um, been listening all morning and uh, and there's a lot of a uh, lot of things, uh, really nice technical things that I became uh, more aware of or in tune. But I like to make my presentation on some, how would I call it, uh, uh, indigenous knowledge. It's the way that uh, our people of First Nations of these lands have uh, continuously maintained over generations, um, which. Uh, which is maybe a little bit more different uh, because uh, we, I don't think we ever consider ourselves as seat keepers or seat uh, savers. And I've never considered myself that. It was always something that I did. So it's ingrained in our life. Uh, as it is in any society, there are people who are uh, play music, who are painters, who are artists, and there are people who garden and, and, and maintain certain things. Uh, there are people who learn speeches, who, uh, and so it's a whole community type of, uh, of being and, and knowledge that's implied into when we're, we're growing in many things. And so um, I have listened uh, uh, in the beginning to things that Kent had said and, uh, about the you know the about the pollination and and so on. Uh, so in uh, in our culture, I'll start with this. So this here is a Hopi rattle. I think you can see and you can hear it. All right. So I'll give you the teaching on this. So everything there is about uh, seed seed growing and maintaining is uh, is taught uh, in a Hopi rattle. And I'll share with you what I've learned. So the handle here, this is the male part. The gourd with the flower, the blossom on, on here. This is the female. And then when the male is joined with the female, and this is the white eagle fluff or plume is what comes out of the male and, and is joined with, uh, with the blossom. So it becomes pollinated. And then as the light begins to roll, you hear it in the rattle. So the teaching of pollination is all just right here in this rattle. And so together, as a new life is, 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 is created, uh, we call it, 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 it creates a song, it's music. So in uh, First Nations people, as many other indigenous uh, people, or around the world, uh, music is a very important part. And for us, it's it's the same. And so this is a, a, a song that we use when we're planting and it goes like this. So this is uh, very quick. And, and, and so that's part of our ways. And I think it's, uh, uh, for me, it's very important to, sh to share uh, more than ever in, in this time that we live in, in a, in a world of change. And so um, in the, the year uh, 2012, people uh, were aware that uh, the Mayan calendar was coming to an end. And I was at my first conference on corn uh, in Mexico in 2012, even though I've done other conferences here in, uh, in North America. 
Uh, people were believing that it was uh, the end of the world, but it wasn't. It was the end of a time period. And so if we look around, everything that's going around right now, I really truly believe that there are hardly any more birds, there are hardly butterflies, bees, uh, everything, everything. So we're changing. The weather is changing uh, right up until not long ago. It was so warm for this part of the, where we are. And the last two days uh, past, we've had like 25 below zero. So we're going from one extreme to another. But one thing is that uh, our elders, uh, who we depend on, still a lot on for their, their knowledge that's been passed on to the generations, that uh, they uh, let us know about uh, how do we adapt to the seasons and the change that, that it's coming. So we always have to maintain for us our spiritual understanding, our spiritual application of our knowledge to our gardens. So planting and planting seeds and growing crops is fine. But you also, for us, the biggest important part of it is the spiritual connection, how these two things come together. So there's the spiritual knowledge and then the physical that work together. And these are the things that have transcended uh, generations and the millennium. And so the first place to begin is for us in our teaching is uh, our calendar. So this is the calendar of the First Nations people. This is a turtle or snapping turtle. And it's an instrument that we use among the Iroquois people in a sacred songs in our ceremonies. And it begins that on the turtle, there are 13 plates as there are 13 moons. And each around the edge, there are 28 of these representing 28 days in a lunar month. And so you take 13 moons times 28 will give you 364 days, which is a perfect lunar and uh, year. And in the Julian calendar, they have to make a leap year every four years because they have to adjust that time. And the, the same thing on our people, it, it has always been there. So if we follow a traditional uh, calendar by planting by the moon, uh, it's all self-contained. And in the moon, there are four parts. And I, I like, uh, it begins with the new moon. And then I like what it goes to, I call wax on. It's something that I learned from Mr. Mayagi. So there's wax on and there's wax off or noted as uh, the dark side of the moon. And I'm not talking about Pink Floyd, you know, and it's always good to have a little bit of fun and, 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 and humor because this is very important because all these things together are alive and this would generate, generate uh, a good well-being and, 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 and mind. And also it's thing that we practice and we pass down to the generations and our children and our grandchildren, which is very important aspect of, of maintaining and, uh, and cultivating seeds for the future. So all of these things, and then the, it is, the cycle is complete with the full moon. When the moon is full, so you, you, you start with the new moon and then, then the full moon. One is dark and one is light. And so everything is contained in here. So this is some of the indigenous knowledge that I, I want to share uh, with you all. And because uh, to me, these are very important. And, and working and having that understanding about uh, creation and, and our responsibility to the land, to the seeds, and to one another, uh, the sharing of, uh, of our, our knowledge of our culture uh, is very important. And uh, so, <clears throat> so working with the with the movements of nature. This here is a pipe. This is the clay pipe, and many of the uh, you know archaeological digs and uh, finds where uh, First Nations villages are. Uh, you, you find these pipes. So for us, the, the use of this pipe is that in the springtime, when our grandfathers, the thunderers, return from the west, you hear their voice in the sky. What our people will do is they'll take tobacco and they'll put it in this pipe and they'll go and they'll smoke it. And they'll go outside and they'll greet 
our grandfathers. So we keep that connection. And then we ask that we remains a balance in what goes on in the, in the universe and the cosmos that rain would come and to nurse the garden and would fill the creeks and, and, and the, the lakes and all the river bodies of water. And so this is very important, but at the same time, if it rained too much, then it would uh, flood out our gardens and so on. So we always strive to maintain, you know, this type of balance with nature. And part of the, the balance is our responsibility of, of maintaining these things. And, you know, it may be like a very simple thing to do, but for some people, they don't have time to do this and to do that. And then, and look at where we are today in the universe. So part of the sacredness to, to maintaining these things uh, is very important amongst all indigenous or first nations people. And uh, in the Southwest, the, uh, the Pueblo, Pueblo people, they make these little pottery pots or pottery. And this is from a place called Acoma Pueblo. And this is a seed jar. So, and it's a beautiful, and so we think about it. How do you keep feed, or how do you keep something that you, you feel that is so precious? We put it in something that we consider uh, like a work of art, because it is both together, the knowledge, the seed, and where we store it. And so this, this jar here is maintained for tobacco, or very fine seed. And tobacco is the what we use to reconnect with the spiritual world. And so when we're growing things, it's not just putting a seed in the ground, but for us, it's the physical application of the knowledge of our forefathers that we maintain. And we maintain what we call seven generations. And so all of this is contained in what we're planting. It's not about just putting a, a seed in the ground. So this is, a, and this is what we do. And this is how we still live today. So we just finished our midwinter ceremonies here within the Iroquois Confederacy, which we are the people of Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, Senecas, and Tuscarora. We just finished last week. Uh, it, and this begins with uh, the agriculture and ceremonial cycle. And it, it, it begins when the Pleiades are directly north of us. And our, in our creation story, our people came from there, came to, from the Pleiades onto this world, and the things grew from there. So the, our creation story is long, but all our plants, we go back to our creation story. And so um, getting back into uh, what I was supposed to talk about is about the squash. So once again, the squash and the gourds are something that go back that, uh, to our creation story. So in the creation story, the, the sky woman was with child and then she gave birth and she was... Uh, she was blessed with a daughter. And so on the world, there was just a mother and her daughter. And at some point when the, the daughter was much older, she was in a, uh, they were, she was visited by a spirit, the spirit of the wind and placed two arrows on her body. And because she never saw another being other than her and her mother, she fainted. And when she woke, uh, she discovered that there was a child growing in her. And so what happened as the ch children got older, came into this world, well, we had one that came out as all children come out, and then one came out on the side of their mother. And so the one that came out on the side of the mother, the mother died, and they placed her body in the ground. And then from there grew the uh, sacred food crops of our people. And so for our people, uh, these are our sacred food crops. First, it begins with tobacco. And so tobacco, it says it grew from her head or her mind. And in all the ceremonies that we begin, we say that we gather our minds together and, and we offer the sacred tobacco, which we cast upon the fire. And as the tobacco transforms as it burns, it ascends into the sky world and it takes the wishes of the people into, into creation or to our creator. So that's the first, the tobacco. Secondly, is strawberries, it grew from the heart of our mother, the earth. And the strawberries, again, are a very sacred plant. And in all our ceremonies of our people, we always have strawberries in there. It signifies that it's the shape of a heart and it's the heart of our great spirit. And when you squeeze the berry, the juice is the color of blood, which is the energy of life. It's a life force 
the water of our mother, the earth. So with all this understanding and connection, this is what reaffirms the knowledge that we continue to practice to ensure to have good, a good crops. So it's all interconnected. So for us, it's not just, again, putting a seed in the ground. There's all this interconnection of understanding and maintaining that this is our identity, this is our culture, this is our way of life. So we don't just say, well, we're seed savers. It's what we live. So going on to that, the next part is corn. So corn grew from the breast of our mother, the earth. And so here's a, one of our, our, our corn. And in the fall, like maybe around mid-August uh, to Labor Day, the corn is full of milk. And, and you can use it that, in this way. And so what happens inside of uh, the breast of the female, there's also milk. And so when we let the corn to mature and dry, and we save it for the winter, it becomes one of the main staples of our life, is oneste, oneha, corn. And it makes up the most important part of ceremony, ceremonial food, and the maintenance of our culture and identity is all in this corn. So this, this corn is a type of Eastern corn, which were people of, of the Eastern part of uh, North America. And this is a, a flint, and flint varieties go very well in our area. So you see where people are, the corns are very different. We're all related and similar, but it's uh, corn is where uh, is a big important part of our culture. So oneha, corn. And so next is beans, ozaheda. So in the creation story, it talks about beans growing from our hands of the mother earth. So if you look at our hands, this is this looks like a bean pot. And there's the joints, just like on a bean, it's right there. So, so that's what we say. It grew from her hands, from her fingers, beans. So this is a bean here. I don't know if you can be able to see it quite well, but uh, my friend just bought this here um, from uh, Mexico. And it may have day then issues, but I'm going to try because that's where everything came from originally in North America was from South America, even our people. We came from the South at one time and over a millennium, our people uh, migrated North and we stopped where we are here in this area because this is the furthest North of the point where we can grow corn. <clears throat> now we're gonna get into the squash. So in our language, we call it Jonarista or Jonarista Gertote. So, which means, it, which translates that the belly button is pushed out, jonaritsa, meaning the umbilical. And so when you see corn, uh, excuse me, when you see squash or pumpkins growing in the garden, they're hooked up to this umbilical cord. And it says in our language that it grew from the umbilical cord of our mother, the earth. And so this is where the word for squash originated. So this is the original name for squash. And as we know, there are many different varieties, which I'll get into very quickly in, in a moment. Um, and then gutse, which is a gourd. So in our language, we call it gutse, and it's a fruit. And so later when the Europeans brought uh, pears, pear trees, uh, it looks very similar to this. So. So it's called gutset, and the pear is uh, gahe. So gutset gahe, meaning the shape of uh, the gourd fruit. That's, what, that's uh, what a pear is called in our language. So a lot of these modern or contemporary things, their roots are come from ancient things. And so everything in our language is because it's descriptive. So this is how it becomes. So this is a gourd, okay? Now squash belongs to basically three, three families, three different families in our area, at least here in the Northeast, we have uh, Maxima, we have Pepo, and then we have Machadas. And so this is a, a, a squash that just dried. I have a couple that just dried on their own. So I left it. I just left it like that. So beautiful to see. And you shake it, you hear it. So you hear the, the seeds, which is the continuum of life right in there, all contained 
right here what grows in our garden and and it's important to keep uh to keep the seed in a good way uh with song dance the knowledge but at the same time applying that knowledge uh of uh basically we grow them in uh separation or isolation or we could grow one of each family in the same big garden and they don't cross you know or they don't cross very easily i do know or become aware that over time some people have been trying to do that and i wonder why the people just want to do that where i strive hard to maintain some of the older varieties and keep them going so having said that back in the early 1980s i got involved with the seed savers exchange and in there i got some uh, very very uh um, interesting uh, different type of seeds but at that time I didn't really know that much about uh, um, pollinating or hand pollinating I knew about isolating and that but at, in this time period there was a lot of bees and there was a lot of birds a lot of butterflies which we don't see hardly any more today so these things could cross very easily either than growing them far apart or really just grow a variety of two that you really like and for different purposes. And so over the years, people ask me, oh, well, Steve, uh, what kind of squash should I grow? So I would say, well, first thing I would ask them, well, what do you want to do with it? So they say, well, like what? Well, do you like to uh, use it for soup? Uh, do you like to make pies and cookies? Or, uh, or do you want to use it as a vegetable? So, and the reason for that is so that you kind of narrow down maybe some of the use that they want. And then, uh, and then I would recommend different varieties, varieties that would keep a long time, some varieties that you could use almost right away, or uh, and so on. And uh, and so this is the way I would uh, approach that subject. So uh, what happened was over time, I being involved with seed savers, they've always used to talk about the vegetables of New York. So I have one here, vegetables of New York. And so uh, then I discovered it, that it was at this library in Geneva, New York. I, uh, and uh, the story goes that these, uh, someone discovered in their warehouse, there was boxes of these. So at that time, they were selling them at the price of 350, which was the price that they uh, originally sold them at. So uh, Geneva is on the way to Tuscarora, which is about one hour west of uh, Onondaga near Syracuse, New York. So I stopped there and I bought a couple of, couple of these. I give them some to a friends of mine, I shared, and I've kept some for my own my own use. And they're excellent uh, reference and resources. So this here is uh, called, uh, they called it the uh, Boston Merrill, or we call it the Buffalo Creek squash. So this variety, there was a large Iroquois or Haudenosaunee village at Buffalo, New York, and it was called Buffalo Creek. It was a little bit close to Hamburg, and that's where the last of our people lived before, uh, because of the you know the uh, Revolutionary War and so on, and different things and land displacement, which we're very well familiar with. Our people always being pushed out of our territories and so on. But uh, the thing is. Uh, it, it originally was collected there and it, it was a very uh it's a very good uh, type of winter squash and so if you look at some old feed catalogs they list the squash as uh, summer squash it's the variety that you're going to eat that produces maybe by you know just under uh 50 days or so and zucchini is a very popular type of uh, summer squash that people are more, more familiar with and then there are fall varieties. So uh, old catalogs referred to as uh, fall and some of the fall squash. So these are basically like winter types, but uh, they, they're really good to use like right in uh, September, way up until the, the end of Halloween. And the reason for that, uh, after Halloween, the, the fiber inside of it begins to change and becomes uh, begins to get kind of bland. And it doesn't have very much flavor from that point. I mean, you still can use it because if you, you got to put yourself in the mindset of the how do people live before there were grocery stores. We depended on what grew in the garden. And when you have to depend on what grows in the garden, and I think that's where we have to return to today, uh, 
we have to use the food as they come along. So as soon as we can be able to feed ourselves, uh, then uh, this is how we, we, we use or utilize the different things. So of all varieties, an example is an acorn squash. So those of you who are familiar with acorn, the, the green acorns, there are a few different ones now. There's some uh, uh, yellow ones and a few white varieties, but this is basically a fall variety of squash. And they're very good uh, to use right away, like right after Labor Day until the end of Halloween. I mean, yeah. And then they become very bland. And what you see in the grocery store are you now are grown maybe in California or they come from Mexico. So it's a little bit uh, more different. But if you have one that's kept all, all fall right up until now and you try it, you would see that uh, it's not doesn't have very good flavor. So just having said that, but it's your own choice. I don't tell people what to do. I just try to share some of that information and knowledge. But sometimes we have to learn by trial and error. And that's important too. So, Silverberry, I, sorry, I sorry to interrupt. I feel like I could listen to you all day. I am supposed to also give you a couple minute warning here. Um, so, okay, the next round going. Um, so, if you have any kind of last thoughts you want to share, or if people have any questions at this moment, we have just three more minutes before the next presentation. Oh, okay. Well, I can end it right now because I'm going to get stuck talking a lot of things. My story years <laughs> are long. So I'll just say, Ona, and thank you for uh, tuning in. And I hope that it was, uh, you know, helpful. Uh, I always like to, you know, because it's it's something culture. This is, for us, this is our land and this is who we are and this is what we strive to maintain. So I just want to share that with you. Okay, Ona. I mean, so it means much. goodbye in our language. And we do have three minutes left. If anyone does have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I can read them aloud. Uh, Silver Bear, we're, I'm just seeing a lot of people saying thank you so much for all of your knowledge and, and for sharing that with all of us. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is one question here. Joy is asking, what was the, oh, sorry, was the squash picture you showed from a book? Yeah, that was um, <clears throat> in Buffalo Creek or Boston Marrow. Oh, uh, very quickly then, this has always been my, my, my personal guide and my personal Bible to growing squash. Uh, seed catalog from 1887 of uh, J.H. Gregory, the squash king of New England. And uh, I like uh, old catalogs because there's a lot of information in there that is just something else. And so I also had gotten one of these seeds from a, a lady, a woman that was involved in the seed savers back in the, when it began. I don't think uh, she's, I think she's a spirit world now, uh, but I went and I met with her right on one of the farms that Gregory produced a lot of his squash seeds at Marblehead, Massachusetts. Nice. Um, I have another question. Are there a lot of people in your community currently saving and sharing seed? Now we are. Now we are. Uh, and the reason for that is because our, our grandparents, as you know, a lot of them were taken away and put in these residential schools and a lot of bad things happen and, uh, you know, and uh, to them, to our, to our parents and grandparents, and a lot of that cultural knowledge and everything, and the pride of being who we are was uh, literally beat out of our people. And today, uh, that you hear in the news, especially in Canada, where there are thousands of uh, bodies and graves being found across Canada, where the schools are. And, it, and it's really, you know, it's a sad part of the Canadian history, but even the Pope last fall came here to apologize. So what I'm talking about is something that really happened. So it affected all of, you know, the, these uh, these ways, the knowledge of our forefathers, which we're trying very hard to, to regenerate. And I've been fortunate as a, a younger person traveling to our territories 
that some of the old timers still had a few varieties of this and varieties of, of different things, both leavings and, and different types of corn. And so in the last number of years, uh, the rematriation of different different things because uh, part of our way, we've always shared with everybody, the, the native and non-native, and some of them, you know, held on to it because uh, of the importance, but how it grew well in their area. And so that's, and so that's why things were maintained because they did well where they are. A lot of, a lot of varieties were maintained by, uh, you know, like Amish and people in, in the, you know, in Kentucky and in the mountains, which originally came from First Nation people. Cherokee and so on, along with Iroquois people, and these varieties were well suited to where they are, and so that's why uh, it's done so well, and that's why it's still there. But uh, you know, the, the knowledge and uh, the spiritual knowledge for us is what uh, we still hold on to. Well, thank you again so much, um, Sister Anna. Do you want to move forward and introduce the next? Group? Yes, yes. And again, thank you so much, Sil Silva Bear. You gave us a wonderful, wonderful presentation and education. And I'm sure we're going to have more questions for you as we wrap up our session this morning. So now we're excited to bring the Jewish Farmer Network on, um, and we, including some of our folks from the West Coast. So hopefully they had enough coffee this morning. And so, uh, Zachary, I'll turn everything over to you uh, for this segment. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, Zach, we can't hear you. Make sure your 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 um, volume is up. We still can't hear you. Zach, maybe we could send you the dial-in number and you could dial in the audio by phone. Hmm. Okay, could um, maybe one of the uh, Janine or Sister Anna? We can, uh, we'll send them the phone number. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Sonia, do you want to start, share the presentation while Zach figures that yeah. out? Great. No, Zach, we can't hear you. All right. Oh yeah. Okay. You're good. Cool. Okay. So um, I'll start. Hi everyone. I'm Masha. Uh, I'm so excited uh, to present here today alongside Kay, Sonia, and Zach as part of the Jewish Seed Project and to talk about the Kishuim here. So uh, we are here as part of the um, Jewish Farmer Network. Next slide, please. Uh, we're here as part of the Jewish Farmer Network, uh, whose purpose is to connect Jewish farmers to resources and community uh, and mobilize Jewish agricultural wisdom for a more just and regenerative food system. So the seed project is just one of the many. Oh, Sonia, do you think you could mute yourself? I think you're getting some, I'm getting some echo. Um, so the seed project is just one of the many offerings of JFN, uh, where finding, growing, and sharing culturally resonant seeds among Jewish seed growers who are typically in North America and uh, we're guided by, and we were initiated by this central question of what is a Jewish seed? So we started our inquiry here with uh, this guy, the Kishuim. It's a variety of Cucumis mellow, also known as Fakusa, Ajur. Um, it's the same species as Armenian cucumber, musk melon, and honeydew. Uh, and we started here because of a story. In ancient texts, uh, during the story of Exodus, after escaping Egypt, uh, it tells the story of how uh, the Jews were wandering the desert, they were parched, uh, it was dry, and they were reminiscing about the juicy fruits of their past. And one of the fruits that is mentioned in this story is uh, the word kishuim in Hebrew. So we don't know for sure if the story exactly happened, you know, that's, that's, obviously something we, we might not know, but we do know that if this fruit was mentioned, there's probably some sort of connection that 
um, our ancestors and the people who wrote these texts had with this fruit. And so our seed project is about rekindling that connection and sort of meeting this fruit again. Next slide. So how do we know that um, the, the word kishuim is linked with uh, the, the, this group of melons today? Sorry, this group of cucamelons today. Um, and it's, it's because of research from botanists and linguists over the last hundred years or so who have once again linked this word to the chait group of melons. Uh, widely, and, and these melons are widely cultivated around the world today by a variety of peoples, including Italians, Palestinians, Egyptians, and probably more. So we're not saying that this is a seed that exclusively belongs to us or that we're the only ones with a relationship with it. It's, it's just a seed that our people have had a relationship with and that we want to continue and reconnect that relationship. Next slide. So what have we been doing with the seed while we've been growing it out? Uh, so our first year of growing it out was in 2021 or 5781 by the Jewish calendar. We started with about six varieties that Kay already had in their collection. We were four, also we were six growers who were accompanied by four organizers and two researchers. After that first season, we sent the seeds back to Kay, who's the, the holder of these seeds, and we selected which ones we wanted, which varieties we wanted to keep, which ones we wanted to set aside, and we decided to add some new ones as well. The following year, 2022 or 5782, we expanded the number of varieties that we were growing. So that included 10 varieties grown out by 13 growers, uh, and we, the number of organizers and researchers was also higher. We were growing in a bunch of different contexts, including homesteads, camps, schools. Uh, for example, on the left-hand side, we have a grower from Gone Academy, which is a Jewish high school in Massachusetts. And on the right-hand side, we have folks from Zumwalt Acres, which is a Jewish farm community in Illinois. So most of our growers are in the US and some are in Canada. As you can see, we have a whole bunch of people who are contributing to this project, various skill sets and, and, and roles. And the people who are presenting today represent the different roles that we're playing in the project. So I'm an organizer driving things forward. Uh, Kay is the founder whose idea was initially was and who is holding these seeds. Sonia is a grower who can share more about the growing experience, and Zach is a researcher who has helped immensely and, and driven our data collection and data analysis as part of this project. So with that, I will hand it over to Kay. Thanks, Masha. So I'm going to talk about origins a little bit, and I'm going to move quickly. So again, if there's questions, we can maybe have time at the end. We'll see. So. Part of the origin thinking for Jewish Seed Project is, is these two terms, uh, diaspora and diaspora, uh, and this idea of rekindling our relationships with our seed kin. Next slide. Through our conferences with the Jewish Farming Network and other meeting groups, we really worked through a lot of the questions um, that Masha brought up, uh, one of the big ones being, what is a seed? And for me, you know, my beginning was with Hudson Valley Seed Company and my rematriation work with Hudson Valley Farm Hub. It's a lot of researching seed stories, talking to people about their seed stories, figuring out responsible ways of sharing them. And I had this moment where I was like, how come I'm not doing this work about seeds of my own people? Why are these stories missing? And one of the big reasons they're missing is because of diaspora. Uh, it's an immense and complex part of our history as Jewish people. Um, the first forced displacement of Jews was sixth century. The diaspora has continued since that time, multiple fractures. And in some ways, diaspora has created a really incredibly intersectional and vibrant Jewish people. And it also represents thousands of years of loss, including seeds. So this was one of the group activities we did looking at diaspora, where are our different diasporas and our, our knowledge of where our families and ancestors came from, which is incredibly diverse. 
And then diasporas, what are the seeds that traveled as well? And where do we as Jewish people in these different diasporas intersect with different seeds and different varieties and different plant families? So that's what this chart is, is looking at. Next slide. So as Masha was talking about when we were thinking about what is a Jewish seed, uh, you know, genocide and forced removal and getting settled on land and then losing that land and then winding up in places where we're not familiar with the lands and soils um, made it really difficult to identify specifically Jewish seeds. Uh, so we started with a lot of varieties of the Kishuim since it was one of the earliest varieties we could identify in text. And um, it's been really interesting because we see the diversity in our community of Jewish farmers. And then we get to see this diversity expressed through the different varieties. Um, this is packaging, packaging up the varieties to mail out um, to different farms, to different folks um, to get growing. And I think one of the interesting things that came out of this is as we were sourcing the seeds, which again came from Italy and Spain and New Jersey uh, and um, Oregon and Armenia and Egypt uh, and Arizona, um, that what we were thinking about was the, the origins um, and the origins are different than where they were sourced. So in some cases we source seeds from uh, national germ, uh, you know, the grin system, um, others came from seed swaps, others came from commercial seed companies. Um, so sourcing them was a challenge. Um, I already had a bunch in my collection, which was nice. And then part of the reason we had to do the first grow out was what do they look like? How do they behave in these soils? Do they match the descriptions um, that we can read in our ancient texts? Um, and where are those differences and to honor that. Um, so then the next slide. Uh, for the grow outs, we really needed to design the way we were growing out the seeds based on um, where the seeds were coming from and this idea of re-meeting our, our seed kin. So we had uh, single varieties that were sent to people so that they could isolate the variety and be able to save seeds from that one variety. Um, and also report back as Zach is going to talk about, about traits and characteristics and how they did and flavor and harvest time and all of that. Uh, and then the other part of the design is diaspora gardens. So in the diaspora garden design, we're actually growing multiple varieties together. Uh, it's like a reunion uh, for, for, that, for that family where not only do we get to meet the plants, in this moment and they get to meet us, but the plants get to share stories in the way that plants share stories with each other, uh, which is in part through pollination. Uh, and so we're actually allowing the, the different varieties to cross pollinate and saving seeds um, from that mix and from the way that they are sharing with each other. Uh, so those are the two different ways um, that it was designed. And then I'm gonna hand this over to Sonia, I think, you know, a big part of this not only was education about how to grow them and how to save seeds, um, but also to invite each grower to have a very personal relationship with the variety or varieties that they're growing, as well as a collective experience um, through the Jewish Farm Network and through the Jewish, Farm, Jewish Seed Project um, to have that experience at home and also to be able to share that out uh, with the community. And so, Sonia, I'm going to hand it off to you to share about your experience as a grower. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, my name is Sonia. I'm one of the growers for the project. And um, I've been growing since the beginning. So, I grew this past season and I grew in 2021, 571 season as well. Um, I am the steward for a farm that belongs to a summer camp called Eden Village West. It's a Jewish summer camp in Healdsburg, California. Um, we're like North Bay, about an hour and a half north of San Francisco area. So Northern California, um, we are zone 9B. It's a Mediterranean climate and the soil is like the clay soil. 
Um, and we're a Jewish summer camp. So the land is like loved on and connected to by children, by staff, by lots of animals. I put a picture of our farm cat Oats in here because Oats really loved to hang out with the Kishui um, this past summer. And um, yeah, I wanted to mention that to bring in a little bit of like the kind of like emotional sort of spiritual connection that these plants had the opportunity to grow around um, both of the years that I grew them. So the first year I was part of the like individual growing out trials of just specific varieties. And I was growing out the dark Lachesi variety. Um, this is an Italian variety from potentially a city called Lecce. Um, and I actually, as part of like research for putting this presentation together, I dug into um, the different like zone maps of Italy and other places where um, these seeds came from and actually found that this variety that I grew the first year is also from zone 9B. Um, which makes sense because I had like a really successful growing season and was able to save a ton of seed and had like really robust plants that produce lots of fruit. So um, as part of my growing practices, I grow everything on drip irrigation and I had the seeds sown just in like a single raised bed um, that was amended with compost. And it's, it was like, yeah, it was a little bit raised. It wasn't like a built up raised bed, but it was sort of rounded up. Um, and I had it mulched with straw. And an important part of the, the first year of the growing trials um, was to keep an isolation distance of a quarter mile from any other cucumber melon or anything in the um, plant family that could cross pollinate. So that was an important piece of the process was making sure that um, there wasn't anyone or the, that I personally wasn't growing anything that could cross pollinate with these plants and that there wasn't anyone around me. Um, luckily the space is large enough that I didn't have to worry about other folks and I could just figure out like my own crop plan to make sure that I wasn't doing anything that would um, cross pollinate. And so this first year, I have these two pictures. The one on the left is um, when I harvested at like peak ripeness. Um, it was really tasty, very like cucumbery. Maybe Zach will share more about the different flavors that we talked about, but um, the fruit wasn't super hairy and it was pretty dark green. And you can see that there's some slight ridging, but it's not super ridged. The picture on the right is um, when the fruit was much more mature. And so this was later in the season and you can tell the color has changed a lot. The ridges are a little bit more defined and the hair is like totally gone at that point. Um, so those are just some of the like phenotype observations that I made this first year. And um, we were able to tell from those observations that this was not a variety that was super uh, aligned with the descriptions that we have in our ancient texts. So this was actually not a variety that got grown out. Um, the second year, I believe. Okay, so the second year, I um, participated in the diaspora garden. So I grew four different varieties um, all together in two beds next to each other. And that, this was like a really special experience for me to be able to uh, bring all these plants together. And um, I got to like plant in community and they were tended by community. And so it, it felt like a really um, special experience to participate in this like separate side of the project. And so I grew out four different varieties. You can see that two of them are Italian varieties. One is a Palestinian variety and one um, that came from the green system. We don't know exactly where the variety is or we, we weren't able to like find a record of it. And so you can tell here that they were pretty different um, in how they all looked. Um, the Fakusa variety was super long, kind of reminded me of like a cucumber or um, an Ar Armenian cucumber. It was like really long and kind of stripy. And then the, the Fakus and Carousella were quite similar. They were super, super fuzzy. Um, the skin was really tough and they were much lighter in color. And then the green variety was like almost uh, hairless, like it didn't have any fuzz on it and um, had kind of this like mottled light green speckly appearance. And that one actually was my favorite. I, I thought it tasted the best. Um, yeah, so those are some of the, these are the four varieties that I grew. I also had volunteers from the first year pop up. So there were like kind of five varieties growing at the same time. Um, here are some zone maps. This is part of me geeking out on uh, finding like where all these seeds are coming from and like why I had such a successful growing season. Um, comparatively, some of the other growers weren't able to keep the seeds alive for, or the plants alive for as long and didn't have as big of yields or save as many seeds. And so I was sort of like, okay, why am I doing so well? here and it's because the zone that I was growing in was really similar from where a lot of these seeds were sourced. So on the right you can see um, at the, the very bottom right you can see Leche and then uh, one of the other seeds came from 
um, a place that's, that's very close to where you see Bari here. So all like similar zone 9B, zone 10A, like really similar um, climates to where I'm growing. And now I'm gonna talk about the seed saving process. So when you're harvesting the cucumber melon to eat it, you're harvesting it before it's fully ripe. So the seeds are really small. They're not um, gonna bother you when you eat them, just like a cucumber from the grocery store. And when we want to save the seed, you have to let it get super ripe and get super um, like rotted and really mushy and gross, but also fun. So on the left, there's some photos of the seed, of the fruits um, after they've gotten like overripe and pretty mushy. And then in the middle, here are some seed photos of like in process seed saving. And then on the right is um, the seeds dried out. And an important part of this is that the seeds needed to ferment because they have this like gooey coating around them. You can sort of see in this like top middle photo, you can kind of see the seeds are encased in this like gooey orangey coat. And the fermentation process is really important to break that down so that you can actually clean off the seeds and let them dry properly. Um, and so that happened in two ways for me. Um, the first year I was able to let most of the seeds actually ferment in the field. So those bottom photos from that first year, I just let everything get super rotted and gross in the field. And then um, the second year I had more uh, like critters trying to munch on the fruits while they were in the field. So I had to harvest them a little bit early and then let them ferment um, just like in jars of water for like a few days before I cleaned them off. And then there was a process of rinsing and sorting out the ones that were not viable and then letting them set up to dry. And um, that was the seed saving process. So I will turn it over now to Zach to talk about the research process. Thanks, Sonia. Can can you hear me? Great. Uh, so yeah, this project's like uh, pretty unique because um, like research is pretty well integrated into this project. Um, and I I got started with researching first of the Jewish Farmer Network back in their um, first in person conference in 2020, where there is. Um, there was a session at the conference on seed keeping. And then um, I facilitated a workshop, a participatory workshop at the end of the conference as a part of um, kind of emerging participatory action research that we were leading. Um, and we led a kind of a reflection, a reflective brainstorm on Jewish seed keeping. So this is the um, kind of the poster paper that was created from this conference. And yeah, so we wanted to kind of continue this participatory action research, which really um, is involves like high level of participation and collaboration of, of project oriented um, kind of goals. So it was it was really high interest to to me, and I work with this with Annika and. And now Eva, so there are three of our researchers, as Masha mentioned. So we're pretty involved in the project in um, all different um, aspects. Um, but we have we have three different goals. So um, so in the next slide. And so yeah, we're helping kind of documenting the project um, in kind of that's the overall goal. And and one of the ways we do it is we kind of collect data through surveys on the phenotypical traits. So we're trying to um, encourage the growers to take pictures, um, detailed pictures, so we can kind of capture the uh, phenotypic traits via photo, but also asking um, farmers to rank different um, different traits that we're looking for, such as such as hairiness and vininess, and then and also taste. Um, aspects as Sonia mentioned. Um, and and then another big aspect is we so we do these like surveys and to for like more about the plants, but then we also um, facilitate reflection among the farmers. So we do interviews and and um, a lot of the uh, growers in the project report that like the interviews are also really important for them to kind of reflect and kind of um, a, about their work in the past season um, with these seeds and 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 their and they share stories of how um, how kind of 
special this um, opportunity was was for them, um, as as Sonia just shared. So, um, and we also like as a researcher, I'm really interested in how growers share knowledge amongst themselves. So, um, one of the things that other growers report who are in different zones, they they really appreciate. Um, Sonia has like made videos of how to um, save seeds. So there's a lot of um, exchange between growers themselves, and that we have a WhatsApp, and we um, we meet um, fairly regularly um, to discuss these issues and and what to do. So um, if you want to move to the next slide, we can I can share a little bit about the next steps. Um, yeah, so like I think the last two years were just like meeting these plants um, and seeds as um, Kay was talking about and and building kind of the knowledge around how to keep these seeds. Um, and now I think we're in a really good space to like actually plan for like outcomes of the project. Like what what do we what do you want to produce? What do you want to share um, out? And one of the things that we're already sharing out is this Jewish seed blog that um, Masha started early on in the project, because a big part of this project is um, not only just sharing seeds, but sharing stories um, and, and making stories. So yeah, I encourage everyone to check out the seed blog. And we also um, ask a lot of questions about like, values and ethics around seed keeping. Um, so we've been doing some collective writing around this um, that we might share out on the pages, um, uh, our pages and our blog. So if you keep following our blog, look for that. And um, in the yeah, the last thing I wanted to mention is that the Jewish Farmer Network, um, as Masha introduced in the beginning, is finally planning its second in-person conference. We like NOFA, like this conference, it's kind of shifted to more virtual format, but I think meeting in person is also valuable and exciting and 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 fun uh, as, as Steve, the importance of uh, fun. Um, so yeah, we're looking ahead to meeting in person. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to answering questions. And, I'll turn it back to Sister Anna for to facilitate. facilitate. <laughs> wow, what uh, what a beautiful presentation! And a lot that uh, we all got from this and learned, and it's so exciting. What an exciting project as well. We did have one question that came through from Chris McHugh and uh, Silverberry. You could jump in too. If some of the seeds in a melon or other wet set seeded fruit have on gray or blackish, are they still okay to save for planting? This is a great question. In in my process, I was picking out seeds that looked like that. Um, so I like I would err on the side of caution, but I, I it's also possible. I don't know. Maybe Kay, do you want to jump in? Yeah, it's hard to do like two broad strokes, but I wouldn't. I would separate them out. And it, and actually, once you dry things down, I would say if you winnow them, those seeds will probably come out in the window on their own anyway. One of the things with the melon, with this particular melon we were working with, um, you can really see the difference between a viable seed and a not viable seed. The viable seeds are kind of plump and cherubic, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like adorable. And you're like, oh yeah, there's, there's a lot of life in there. Uh, and the ones that aren't are very flat and hollow feeling and papery. Um, but the issue with black seeds, um, you know, or seeds that look like they have mold on them would be, you really want to make sure that you're not storing seeds together um, that have any kind of um, surface mold or surface disease on them with the others. So that would be another reason to clear, clean those out. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Masha or Steve, um, um, Silverbear, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that question? Thank you for that question, Chris. No, okay. Steve, I think, um, I think you're muted, Silver Bear. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, I can answer the uh, 
the question very well. And it, it just part of the overall when uh, keeping seed is, uh, you know, the ones that are like very light or not mature, or if there's mold on it, we just discard them. They all can be added to the compost, so there's no waste. The same thing with beans, beans that are in the darker, deeper color are, uh, you know, are preferred over the ones that they're, they were more pale and didn't seem to mature properly. So that's part of seed keeping is, uh, you know, all these little things. And, um, you know, you want to ensure uh, to have a good seed uh, to start with uh, every growing season. So all these little other, other things that come along, uh, it's not even worth to say, well, I'm going to try to grow it out and see what will happen. Because it, in a way, maybe it's nonsensical because uh, you will lose the whole season just to be disappointed in in my uh, personal experience. So, uh, you know, and, and sometimes uh, disappointments uh, that happen, uh, you know, it affects some people won't even grow the next year because of certain things that went on. So you want to keep, uh, you want you want to keep an eye on, and that's part of education is sharing and teaching each other about what's good quality seed. And so people uh, remain encouraged to grow things. But I've seen many times where, you know, people went out and they did all kinds of things and they got overwhelmed. And then the next year said, oh, I had too much problem last year. You know, it's not worth it. But, mm -hmm. uh, but at least giving the, 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 the information and that's what's the most important. And then what they make of it is something that's their choice. So mm -hmm. they could be mm -hmm. part of the, they could be part of the whole process if they want. That's all. Okay. All right. Well, I want to take this time to thank you all. This was informative. It was beautiful to hear this wonderful, these wonderful stories uh, of seed saving and the history of seeds, that di diaspora story, uh, very important to everyone. And so I want to thank you all, particularly our partners from the West Coast. I know this was a lift to get up that early, so we are so grateful to you. Uh, just to remind everyone that our second session of Seed Saving Sunday begins at 2.30. Uh, this afternoon. So we look forward to seeing everyone. We're going to talk a little bit more about beans. Um, and so that's going to be another wonderful presentation. So everyone, please uh, enjoy your lunch, your break, and we'll see you back here at 2.30. Thank you all so much.